Thank you, Chris. Can you all hear me out there? OK, great. So as Chris said, I'm from Arizona. I've been doing wildlife rehab for the past 30 years. Um, and it started innocently enough. My wife uh, and I were going through the paper one day and saw an ad for an open house at the Arizona St State Game and Fish facility that was a rehab center. We thought, oh, it sounds like a fun thing to do. Just like you today are out here doing something fun. So we wandered around up there. We saw mammals. We saw birds. We saw all sorts of different things, reptiles. And I saw a booth that said they're looking for volunteers. So I thought, well, there's a great idea. We, could, we got some time. We can do that. So we signed up and didn't hear back from them for some time. And finally, when they called, we thought, OK, great. Yeah, we can volunteer. We'll be working with the mammals because we knew something about that. But no, that's not what nature had in store for us. We started working with the birds of prey. Now, at that point, what I knew about birds of prey was that they had feathers. <laughs> I was pretty sure they had feathers. So I knew nothing, and my wife knew nothing. But we started working, we started feeding, cleaning, uh, changing waters, reading, researching, understand, trying to understand what these birds are all about. And she got a hold of a book by a lady named Kay McKeever out of Canada called A Place for Owls. And in the book, Kate was saying that she was using a spectacled owl to foster young birds. And we thought, well, that's really a smart idea. Because one of the issues that you have is when you have a baby bird that comes in, the eyes aren't open yet. If, you, if you're feeding it, it sees you, it hears you talking, it will imprint itself, which means it loses its identity as a species and identifies with humans. And it's hard to release them back into the wild like that because they don't understand their place in nature. So you'd always try and put on a sheet and a mask and not talk, and it was hard, it was cumbersome, and it was not very effective. So the director of the center at the time said, OK, the next time we get an injured barn owl, and you can turn it into a foster parent, as though it was just to turn a switch and that would happen magically. Well, we got a little barn owl in. It was a fledgling, but somebody had picked it up by the wingtips, and in struggling, it dislocated both of his wings. So he was not going to be flighted. But he also had some infections. He had giardia. He had chlamydia. He had E. coli. This bird was so infected, nobody thought he would live. Our veterinarian actually had to put incisions into his knees and hot pack him to relieve the pressure and to drain that infection out. Now, we had to force feed him, hand feed him for almost nine months. Nobody thought this bird would survive. Finally, on Christmas Day, he ate on his own for the first time. And that was our Christmas present. The following spring, he was ambulatory. He's out. He's walking around. And we thought, OK, good. And then we started getting babies in. We got one, then two. And of course, all the researchers would say, oh, a, fo a male won't foster. Well, Chia did not read the book. <laughs> so for the very first year, we got 13 nestling barn owls in that he raised and it got released. We kept one female for a year as a companion. The next year they raised about 28. She got released and we got a non-releasable female in who had been at another center for years, mainly just living in a kennel. So we put her in with the male and she just sat there, thousand yard stare, nothing. We put babies in, 1,000-yard stare, nothing. We tried everything. Nothing seemed to work with her. And he's busy trying to feed the kids and you know, introduce, you know, get mom to wake up. All of a sudden, a switch went off in her head, and she became mom. Now, you, uh, generally, a barn owl will have a, a clutch of oh, four to eight to 10 eggs. They can produce a lot of young. Well, we get up to 10 or 15 in with her. We take everybody out and clean. And we put her back in with three more. And Chia would walk up his little ramp, peek around the corner, and go, how many are in there now? <laughs> and it became a process. Uh, she's just constantly calling for him for food. And they're back and forth and back and forth. And so but what would happen after several years of this when the chicks were all gone, they started to still do the food calling. So she'd pick up food, or he'd pick up food and call to her. She'd come and take it, look around. No babies. Give it back to him. 
He'd look around, make the food calls back to her. It goes back and forth and back. But anyway, they got to be incredible, incredible foster parents. Well, because we were successful in the beginning with this, some of the other uh, people at the wildlife center there were using great horned owls and starting to foster. And it just took off. It was so wonderful to see these birds that were damaged, can't release into the wild, raising young, healthy, able to get back out into the wild. Now at that time, because all of these birds are, are covered under US Fish and Wildlife Service protections, and we, everything we keep has to have a, a reason and a permit, it has to be on our permit, they did not have any sort of offering for companion birds, for foster parenting, et cetera. And so my wife was constantly on our permits person in Albuquerque, where our region is, saying, look, you're concerned about the health of the birds. What about their mental health? What about their, so their socialness? They need companionship. And so finally, we started getting permits for our foster parents and companion birds. And then she would, we'd also place other animals around other parts of the country. And they'd say, well, if you've got one great horned owl, you need to have two. Well, we're not, we're not allowed to have companions. The Fish and Wildlife won't allow it. I said, well, have your permits person talk to Albuquerque. And finally, over time, all organizations now are allowed to have companion birds, and it makes a huge difference. I remember one lady called, and she, she wanted a hawk that we had. We said, fine, what else do you have? We have a bar now. I said, you need another bar now. Oh, no. She's just fine as she is. She's perfectly happy. No, if you want the hawk, you get another bar now. So she applied for it, got it. We shipped them off. And about a week later, she calls back and goes, oh my God, I cannot believe the behavior change. She is so much happier. Socialness is not just something that people have. All wildlife does. And the owls especially are great parents. So it makes a wonderful concept of Getting these, and we get a lot of nestlings in. Our, our environment in the desert is quite different than you're seeing here. All these beautiful trees and the landscape here, open desert, parking lots, construction sites, great horned owls are nesting on pillars and parking lots, rooftops, areas that when the young come down, because it's hot, they jump out of the nest, they're on the ground. If you try and put them back up, any other nestlings will bail out. So it's better to just bring them in and put them in with the fosters and get them back out. Now, Wild at Heart, when we started, we thought, well, all the birds we were getting in were under our game and fish's permits. So we thought, well, we should probably get our own permits and be a standalone organization. And everybody thought, that's a great idea for you guys to do that. <laughs> well, it can't be that bad. We maybe see, you know, 50 or 60 birds a year. So we got our permits. The first year, 140 birds of prey came into our center. <laughs> and at that point, we had no background. We had no backing. It was all strictly out of our pocket. We had no, no supporters whatsoever. So we had to build that or start to build that organization from the beginning. And it's all through donations. There's no state. There's no federal funding for what we do. Corporate help is almost non-existent in Arizona. So we, we rely on the public to help support us. Now, we have since moved from our original site to a site in, Air, in, in Cave Creek, where now we see about 800 birds, birds of prey every year come through our facility. It's an incredibly active facility. I think so far this year, we're, we're up to about 175 intakes so far. And the summer months are our worst, because what happens is the young are starting to fledge. It's hot, it's dry, there's no water, very little prey. They're on the ground, and they're at risk. And so the public brings them into us. We do what we can to get them back out into the wild. And I think we're very successful. We have about a 50% release rate, which is quite high. Birds of prey, when they're damaged or injured, they do everything they can to stay upright or up in the trees. Because once they're on the ground or lying down, they are at risk from predators. So they will use their last ounce of energy to stay alive. So by the time they're down on the ground, Sometimes there's not much we can do, except give them a quiet, calm, peaceful place to pass. We also, so we see a lot of different injuries and reasons for them to come in, besides just being young nestlings out of, their, out of the ground. We have a disease called trichomoniasis, which is a protozoan infection 
they get from uh, eating from bad water, from eating prey that's already infected, like doves, pigeons, etc. And it creates these thick growths or plaques throughout their respiratory tract that just it, it cuts off their air supply. And so without treatment, they die a very painful death. But so we get a lot of those in every year. Gunshots. Also, a lot of gunshot birds come into our center, which just drives me insane that people are still out there shooting birds of prey that um, are really very, very valuable. When you look at a nesting pair of barn owls feeding young, they can consume over a thousand rodents in a year. That's just one pair. So by, re by eliminating that pair, the amount of rats that are uh, rodents are just going to, you know, absolutely, you know, explode. So people want to control rodents. So what do they do? They put out poison. What does poison do? It poisons the animal, it poisons the owl, it poisons the rat, and the owl eats that rat that's been poisoned, and it has been poisoned. So we see a lot of that. And now there are products out there that are birth control for rodents, for pigeons, et cetera. It takes a lot longer, but you break that reproductive cycle and it really reduces the population. But it's a big part of education to get these people who are just putting bait boxes out everywhere to stop doing that. Because it's not just the rats and the birds of prey that are being affected, it's domestics. Cats and dogs will eat a rat, a rat or a mouse that's been poisoned. Coyotes, et cetera. Everything in the food chain that will eat a rodent has the possibility of being affected by poisoning. And poisoning also gets down into our groundwater. We have pesticides that are into the water. So it's a really, it's a big, big issue. So rehab for us, it's, it's a whole different concept than what we have going on here, which is a wonderful center. I am just so amazed and pleased to be here to see what they're able to do as far as education goes. But we answer our telephone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we get calls from all over the state of Arizona. Now, not just the state of Arizona, but around the world. And I was just telling one of the folks here earlier that one of the best calls we had was in a gentleman called my wife from Kenya in Africa. And he'd had a, gotten in a, a, a uh, white-faced scopes owl that was injured I was desperately trying to find help for it. So we go, okay, uh, it's a little far for us to drive, but let me see what we can do. So my wife starts calling people, and one of our volunteers and her husband had set up a gorilla sanctuary in Africa years prior. So we contacted her, she contacted a gentleman who contacted a friend of his who could help, and he contacted the gentleman with the owl. And he said, okay, I can pick it up uh, tomorrow, where do you live? The guy gave him the address, and he said, where? He gave him the address again, and he says, well, heck, I jog in front of your house every morning. So that, that circularity is just amazing to see what can happen. But we've had calls from you know, South America, from Nepal, from different states around, around the U.S. because people are desperate to find help for these birds, these owls. And so we also do a lot of work with a species called the burrowing owl. And I think uh, the falconry display out here, uh, New England falconry has a little burrowing owl out there. It's one of the, probably a Floridian. But in Arizona, the big issue is construction, habitat loss, habitat destruction. And so because of that, the burrowing owls live underground. And because of all this construction, they're being bladed out of existence. And so what we have set up in the last, over the last 25 years is a system whereby developers can contact us. We go out, I live trap the birds, bring, and excavate their burrows to make sure there's nothing left behind. And then we actually build artificial burrow systems for them in areas that aren't going to be developed. Now over the years, I think we've recovered probably over 5,000 burrowing owls and built you know, eight to 10,000 artificial burrows throughout the state of Arizona. It's the largest project like it anywhere. And it's proven to be very, very effective. So the, the whole concept of rehabilitation starts with you people. You're the ones who see the injured animal on the ground. And what do we do when we see that? Well, number one, if possible, the best thing to do is to get it contained 
If it's injured, wrap it up in a little towel, get into a kennel or a box with a towel underneath it, keep it warm, dark, quiet, and get a hold of your local organization and get it to them as quickly as you can. Because I get calls all the time saying, somebody says, I was driving by and I saw an injured owl on the side of the road. Okay, where? Okay, when? Oh, it was about two hours ago. And it's like, well, are you, if you're not there with it, oh, it's not moving. Yeah, well, oftentimes they do, or somebody else has seen it and called and taken care of it. So it's hard for us to send a volunteer out to look at those situations. So ideally, if you can't contain it, get a hold of someone and, have, and wait for them to come out and make sure it's taken care of. Because an injured animal, even though it looks like it's dead, it's not doing anything, can actually get up and move quite, quite a long distance. I get calls all the time saying, oh, the owl is hurt, it's laying on, it's on the ground, it's been there for a day and it's not moving, I walk right up, I'm close to it, it's not doing anything. How close are you? Oh, I'm 10 feet away. No, go closer. It's not moving. Go closer. Give it a little nudge with your foot, and it takes off. Because they've just eaten, or they're just like, they just don't care about people. You know, we're really not anything that they care about, so we're not a big concern to them. So we see that all the time. So we have to really look at the situation and evaluate it at a distance without seeing to make sure that it actually is an injured animal. Or they'll call and they say, I have an injured owl, okay? Send me a picture, okay? And you look at it and go, well, it, it's a bird, but it's certainly not an owl. And, you know, so people don't know exactly what they're looking at. Um, and so we try to identify things because, we, like I say, we only deal with birds of prey, but there are other centers that do the smaller birds and, and water birds, et cetera, so then we can inform the public where to go to make sure that that is taken care of. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of work. You know, all of our organization is done through volunteers. We have groups that come out, uh, they'll help us clear, the, clear our land, do our weeding. Right now, today, in Arizona, about 100 miles from our center, we're building artificial burrow systems for the burrowing owls that we, we're holding right now. And there's a group of probably 40 volunteers out there digging in the dirt and putting in this, this artificial system. And that's the only way that our wildlife, our owls, are going to thrive and survive is with the help of the general public. We have to become involved in some little way, whether it's through volunteering, whether it's through donation, whether it's just making sure you're aware of what the owls are, what their habitat is, what the stressors are on that situation. Clean water is critical especially in Arizona where we don't get much rain. Our average rainfall there is seven inches a year. And the last couple of years we haven't gotten near that. So that's a huge issue is water. Um, so you wanna make sure if you have an area where you have uh, owls in the area, put up nest boxes. You know, little screech owl boxes are great. They work great for that, for kestrels. Barn owl boxes are wonderful. We'll put in nesting boxes. One of our volunteers has taken on the process of getting involved with some of the farms and some of the uh, big corporations and putting in huge barrels that have become owl, great horned owl nests. And in order to get them away from dangerous situations into proper habitat. Now, great horned owls don't build their own nest. They will take over a nest from a red-tailed hawk in Arizona, the Harris Hawks, maybe a raven. And so they will, you know, find good habitat and take it over. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. A number of years ago, I got a phone call from a gentleman saying there was a, a Harris Hawk was on the ground underneath the nest. There was no way of getting it back. So I took it in, brought it back to the center. Everything was good. He calls back a couple hours later. He says, Bob, now, I haven't been drinking yet, but I went up on the roof with my camera and I was looking in that nest and I swear there's a young great horned owl in that hawk nest. And I went, yeah, okay, you haven't been drinking, okay. So I drive over there, get up on his roof, I get my camera out and I look and there's a little young, a juvenile Harris hawk and here's a juvenile Harris Hawk, and mom and dad Harris Hawk are flying overhead, squawking. And right in between the juveniles is a juvenile great horned owl. Well, that's interesting. So 
we did a little bit of research in trying to find out what happened, how that could be. Well, apparently a great horned owl pair had come into this nest and then were disrupted by the Harris hawks. Well, obviously, while they were in the nest, she laid an egg. The hawks came in, laid their eggs, they hatched, and they started raising it, even the odd one. <laughs> so it, and they were just happy as could be all together. But after, eventually, the great horned owl did end up on the ground, and we pulled him in and put him in with a large group of great horned owls. It took him a while to figure out that this is not there's something different here. What is this? Who are you? But over time, he actually learned to become an owl and got released. And since that time, I have heard the same situation in reverse with a hawk in, a, in an owl nest. So it does happen occasionally. But the really important point there is that wildlife doesn't care what it is. If it's a baby, they're going to raise it and care for it. And that's why we get back to this whole concept of foster parenting and why it's so important. Because that way the young can learn the proper behavior of their species. They can socialize with one another. And it makes them much easier to release back into the wild because they know how to act and how to react to certain stimulation in certain situations. So the, the whole idea of companionship, fostering, family is very important. As you're seeing some of the pictures that are floating by overhead, you'll see these large groups of great horned owls. Well, a great horned owl generally has two to three eggs a year. And our fosters may have six or eight or 10 young at one time. And it doesn't matter to them. They're babies, they need to be fed and raised and cared for. So they will take care of all the ones that are in there with them. Now we only do, the, we keep the species the same. We wanna make sure that barn owls are raised by barn owls, great horned owls by great horns. We've had a long-eared owl that was one of our ed birds and we got a nestling in, didn't know what to do with it. We threw it in with our ed bird and she was just happy as can be. So we have to monitor them for a little bit to make sure the young are being cared for. But once they make that connection, they're, they become family. And it, again, like I say, it really allows the young birds to learn their identity as a species and what they can do and how they can react. Uh, we also right now have a, prog a program with the Cactus ferruginous pygmy owl. Big word, small bird. Not the smallest owl in the world, but close to it. They were, the Arizona population is severely limited. They had been on the endangered list for a number of years. And we were in discussion with Fish and Wildlife and Game and Fish about what we can do proactively to help preserve this species. And because they were on the endangered list, we were told, you can do nothing. You have to leave them alone. And we thought, well, that doesn't make sense. We should be captive breeding them. Well, you can't do that. They're endangered. Yeah, I understand they're endangered, but if we could breed them, no, you can't do that. So they were finally delisted about 12 years ago and Fish and Wildlife brought us 10 young birds that we started a captive breeding program with. And we were able to then get them released back in the wild, some of them. But again, it's a learning curve, not just for them, but for us. We were monitoring the, the nest as they were being uh, tended to. So we'd see, oh, the female laid an egg, that's great. And, but she wasn't sitting on it. And the whole day would go by and she never went near the egg. Oh, darn. Then all of a sudden there'd be a second egg. Okay, now she'll start sitting. No, no, not sitting yet. So we're calling all around. There's a researcher, uh, Glenn Proudfoot, that did a lot of work in Texas on this species. And he said, yeah, don't worry about it. They don't start incubating until the third egg is laid. And then they hatch at the same, almost at the same time. So it's behavioral differences that we didn't understand at that point. And so now, we've, now that we know that, it was a great thing because it, it, we were worried constantly about this, this species. And so we've been able to produce a few offspring and get them back out into the wild. And now <laughs> they're thinking of relisting them again. And they're saying, well, if we, if we list them, 
you can't release them because you know once they're listed, if they release one as up with somebody's property, they can't build and they'll sue us. It'll be a horrible thing. And you know we can do a J9 and protection and okay, let's do that. Well, to do this protection, it takes they have to survey all the existing known habitat of the cactus root pygmy owl from 19 from the 2020 uh, 20 uh, 2000 to to date. So that takes a year to do that survey. And then you can apply for it, which will take another six months. So it's like, okay, so a year and a half from now, if we're lucky, we can get this protection done. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, you can release all the birds you have. Well, that's not going to be helpful. So there is on, in southern, southeast, southwestern Arizona is the Tohono O'odham Nation, which is a, 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 an Arizona tribe. And on their reservation, they do have existing habitat and cactus rugeous pygmy owls. We don't know how many because they don't allow fish and wildlife or game and fish to go on the reservation and do the research and do their surveys. But my habitat coordinator, Greg, has worked with them for years. He's built them a library. He has uh, given them computers. He's done a lot of work. So we have a working relationship. And we're in the process now of trying to figure out if we can, in fact, go on the reservation to, to their nation and release birds there. And that would be legally uh, done. So we have to always try and find a different way of doing something to comply with regulations, but sometimes to bend them, bend them around so we can get to where we need to be. It's always an interesting process to figure out the, the right way of doing things because what is most important to us, our goal at our center is everything is aimed for the wealth, welfare of the birds that come into us, the owls, make sure that they have the best chance of survival back in the wild. So building habitat is a huge part of what we do. Choosing proper release sites is a really important thing to do. Barns, farms, et cetera, where there are barn owls, we build nest boxes, we put the, the owls in there. We try and encourage people to put nest boxes up to encourage owls to come in and take over that. We do a lot of work with little western screech owls. And again, people will put a nest box up, we'll put owls in it, and the next, oh, I haven't seen the owl for six months. I'm gonna take that darn thing down. And they go and they open the box up and the owls are in there. So you don't always see them. That's the wonderful thing about owls is they're nocturnal and they like to stay hidden away, except for great horns. They'll stand up and they'll hoot their heads off, uh, especially during springtime when they're mating. You know, here in Arizona, their breeding starts in early December. So they're the first ones to mate in the year, and then it kind of goes down from there. So we, we get, right now, we're getting little tiny fluff balls that are coming in, and some that are almost fully fledged, ready, ready to release. Um, but again, we don't, you can't, it's hard for us because they nestle oftentimes in saguaro cactus where the, the hawks or the ravens have made their nest or just in the crotch, in a, into the bare spot in the crotch in that saguaro. And if you have to go to check a nest, it's really not fun to try and climb the saguaro cactus, let me tell you that. <laughs> now, or we try and re-nest, I've done that. I picked up a little nestling and climbed a ladder went to put it back up and all of a sudden the male came back and just smacked me in the back of the head, almost knocked me into the cactus. And it's like, okay. Uh, so we always try and when we're re-nesting, which we do occasionally, we always make sure we have another person with us to watch out for us because it can be very dangerous. Um, because owls, you know, they're you know, a great horned owl, big, big bird. I had a guy call me one day, there's this huge owl in my backyard. It's got to be 30 pounds. I go, um, have you ever seen a 30 pound turkey? No. That owl weighs about two and a half pounds. Trust me. It's, it's five feet tall. No. No, it's not. <laughs> it's an illusion. Uh, but they have a wingspan of about four feet. So they look much larger than they are. But again, it's just the, the idea of knowing they're there and knowing what how important they are. We also have to let people know that they do like foreign food. Chihuahuas, you know, Sharpays, these small little, small little animals. They say, all they see is a small animal. They don't know that it's, it's your pet. So if you have a small cat or a small dog, don't let them run at night without being out there with them. 
well, you have to come and get these owls away from my, from my property. I said, no, we can't do that. Number one, they're really hard to trap. We have to have a permit to do so. They're not danger, they're not in danger. And even if we did, you would have a false sense of security because if we removed that threat and you think all is safe, well, there's still a nest, there's still habitat there, others will come in, you may not be aware of it, and then you're putting your, your small pets at risk. So no, we can't come out and just remove the owl for your benefit. Probably the strangest call I got was a lady not too far from us, just moved out there from Phoenix, and she says, I want you to come out and remove all the songbirds from my property. <laughs> I said, okay, why? Well, they're pooping on my patio. <laughs> and I go, well, you know, that's why God made hoses. So here's your, op here's your opportunity, here's what you can do. I'll give you two options. Number one, you can build a bubble around your house and live in a bubble, or you can move back into one of those sterile condos in Phoenix. You're in an area here in Cave Creek that is people come out to for the wildlife. They come out here because there are birds here. They come out here because there are bobcats here. You know, they enjoy that. So no, I'm not gonna come out and remove all the songbirds from your property, so. But yeah, we get those calls all the time. People want us to come and remove owls, but we just, we just don't do that. Because again, it's, it's not something that needs to be done. People have to take ownership of it. The other call I get almost every year is springtime, a guy will call and say, I'm being attacked by an owl. Okay, okay, what's going on? Oh, I'm, walking. I'm on my walk, I get hit in the head with this owl. Okay, here's what you do. Walk your dog about 30 feet away from where you're, you're going. How do you know I'm walking my dog? Well, because you're being attacked by a burrowing owl. They live underground. A dog is one of their main predators. He has young, he's protecting his baby, so he's attacking the dog. You just happen to be the tallest part of the dog at this point, because you're on a leash. <laughs> so just walk you know, 30 feet away and you'll be fine. And that always works. Now again, you, the general population, are the biggest boon to wildlife. You see things, you notice things, you're aware of them. The burrowing owls are at such risk in Arizona, but it's the public, it's the general public, people just like you who see signs of construction activity happening, and boy, does my phone start up. They love watching their birds. They love watching their owls. And the reason for that is because, especially the burrowing owls, they're not threatening. They're little guys about nine inches tall. They have wonderful behavior. They're out during the day. They're really crepuscular owls, which means that that, time, that gray time of day, uh, at sun, uh, sunset and sunrise. And they make funny little noises. They bob and they bow. And they're also called the howdy owls in some areas. But people see that as when they're being threatened and they want to have protection for them. And so then I contact the developer or they contact Game and Fish and we make the process and we make it happen. And the other thing that we try to do is when we first started doing this re the relocation was that it would take 60 days for me to get a permit from Fish and Wildlife Service. Every time one needed to be removed, that property owner had to apply for a permit from Fish and Wildlife. It would take 60 days and then we would be able to come in and remove it. So I fought with our Fish and Wildlife people for a long time and said, look, I need to have a permit that allows me to go out when needed to remove these burrowing owls. Because if the developer is gonna take 60 days, oh, inadvertently it got bladed. We, uh, a subcontractor came in, we weren't aware of it, and so they're gone. It's like, yeah, right. So I had a long conversation with the, the new permits person in Albuquerque, and we had a big meeting with a lot of different organizations, and we said, okay, I, this is what we need. He said, okay, we'll get a scientific collecting permit for you. Good, so I filled all the paperwork in, I sent it in, I wait months, it comes back. Nah, this really doesn't qualify for a scientific collecting permit because it's only for owls for relocation. And I go, yeah, that's what we discussed and this is what you told me to do to get the permit that I needed. Well, it really doesn't qualify, you'll have to resubmit. 
Okay, back, reworked the permit application, sent it back in. A couple more months go by. Finally calls me back and he says, yeah, no. I don't think scientific collecting is going to work. It just doesn't fit the qualifications. Uh, we'll have to do something else. And by the way, I'm leaving. I'm going on a special assignment, and you know, I'm going to hand you over to Cami. Okay. So I get a hold of Cami, and I say, this is what we need. And so I'll resend the paperwork in. I sent the paperwork back in. Again, a couple months go by, and the permit comes back, and she says, yeah, no, it doesn't really fit. And so I'm on the phone with her. She says, what you really need is a programmatic standalone permit that will cover you for three years, allowing you to go out at any time to remove these burrowing owls at risk. And I go, yes, exactly. That's what I need. We don't do that. And I go, oh, OK. So we had a more conversations. I finally now have a standalone permit that allows me to go out and remove owls at risk when necessary. It, but it took over a year to get that taken care of. But it's worth it, because now the developers are much happier. And I'm not a big development process person. I would love to stop construction. We're building way too much in the desert. We're tearing out all of our, all of our desert. We're tearing out all of our farmland. All of our dairies are all disappearing, and houses are being built, and solar fields, and everything is coming up. And it's just not great for the environment. But so that's why it's very important for us as individuals to be aware of what's going on in our areas, anything that is going to be a detriment to our environment, to the environmental health, to the health of our wildlife, to the health of our owls, is to get involved, you know, make phone calls, write letters, email, talk to people, get that information out so that you can protect your environment. You're not protecting it for yourself. You're protecting it for your children and the grandchildren and all of the animals that live with us that are important to us. They're important to our health because, of, again, all of the rodents that they will consume over the course of their lifetimes, the insects they eat, all of the things that we don't like to have around that they will eat. But also, it speaks to us spiritually. Anytime you see or hear an owl, it's flying. It just it touches a certain part of your heart that nothing else can do. And to have, for me, we do a lot of education programs also. And every once in a while, I'll see a child's eyes just light up. Their face is an incredible smile when they see that owl this close and make that connection. They've connected to wildlife. They've connected to nature. They've connected to their spiritual being. And that's a very, very important thing. And one of the things that, that we do at Wild at Heart that a lot of organizations don't is we allow younger volunteers to come in. We've had kids as young as eight years old volunteer with their parents. Sometimes they're you know, younger, older teenagers. I had a, a teenage boy and his mom that would come and volunteer once a week, and they would you know, take out the chopped up mouse and rat bits and feed the owls. And they told me after a year when he went off to college, that was the best bonding experience they've ever had. It brought them so close together doing this shared project that was so out of their normal existence, but it created a special bond between them. I have seen young children come in at 10 years old, and they've volunteered, and they've gone on through high school and then college and become veterinarians or biologists, et cetera. And they come back, and they say, thank you, because this is what drove me into this to this field, this passion that we have. So you never know what is going to touch an individual until you get out and you start doing something different. No matter what you, you like to do, find a way to help your environment. It's important to all of us, our groundwater. Every, as we were ta they were talking about all the, water, all the waste we were putting in, into the river. All that gets into the groundwater, that stuff is going into our bodies. Right now, we are so polluted, we are, we are drinking microplastics. It's in our fish, it's in our, it's in our animals. Um, so we need to find a way to clean that and to keep our environment healthy. 
So no matter what you do, if you can, find an organization like Vins or others that you can donate to, that you can volunteer with. Become a bigger part of your community. I always like to say that if every person did one good thing a day, this would be a much better world. So please, you know, think of that, you know, on your daily life. Think about doing one good thing, whether it's for yourself, for your children, for your pets, for nature, for wildlife. Just one good thing a day will make a huge, huge difference.